September 10, this day in history. Good morning. In 1608, Captain John Smith had already had a lifetime of excitement, adventure, and experience by the tender age of 28, when on this day in 1608, he was elected council president at Jamestown, Virginia, the first permanent English settlement in North America. They had a pretty tough time getting started. But they, they did get started, and it's a pretty interesting story. I remember hearing about this uh, around this time of year, actually, in the autumn, when we would talk about pilgrims and Thanksgiving and things like that. Captain John Smith has something to do with all of that. In 1776, General George Washington had asked for a volunteer for an extremely dangerous mission to gather intelligence behind enemy lines before the coming battle of Harlem Heights. On this day in 1776, Captain Nathan Hale of the 19th Regiment of the Continental Army stepped forward and subsequently became one of the first known American spies of the Revolutionary War. In 1813, the Battle of Lake Erie U.S. Captain Oliver Hazard Perry led a fleet of nine American ships to victory over a squadron of six British warships at the Battle of Lake Erie during the War of 1812. 1833. President Andrew Jackson announced on September 10 of 1833 that the government would no longer use the Second Bank of the United States, the country's national bank. He then used his executive power to remove all federal funds from the bank. Traditionally, this bank had been run by a board of directors with ties to industry and manufacturing, and therefore seemed biased towards the urban and industrial northern states. Jackson, the epitome of the frontiersman, <laughs> resented the bank's lack of funding for expansion into the unsettled western territories. Jackson was a man of the common people and felt that the bank symbolized how a privileged class of businessmen oppressed the will of common people in America. It's an interesting story and you can learn more about it at the link in the description. In 1897, the first drunk driving arrest. <laughs> On September 10, 1897, a 25-year-old London taxi driver named George Smith became the first person ever arrested for drunk driving after slamming his cab into a building. Smith later pleaded guilty and was fined 25 shillings. In the United States, the first laws against operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of alcohol went into effect in New York in 1910. In the 1930s, inventive types began to come up with machines that could establish whether one had too much alcohol in the system. The first such device was called a drunkometer. In the 1950s, the more accurate breathalyzer machine was developed, and it wasn't until the 1970s and 80s that public awareness about the dangers of drinking and driving really came to be more commonly known, and lawmakers and law enforcement began to get tougher on offenders. Despite stiff penalties and public awareness campaigns, drunk driving still remains a serious problem in the United States. 1919, almost a year after an armistice officially ended the First World War, New York City held a parade to welcome home General John J. Pershing, Commander-in-Chief of the American Expeditionary Force, AEF, and some 25,000 soldiers who had served in the AEF's 1st Division on the Western Front. 1940. In light of the destruction and terror inflicted on Londoners by a succession of German bombing raids, which the Germans called Blitzkrieg, also known as the Blitz, the British War Cabinet instructed British bombers over Germany to drop their bombs anywhere if unable to reach their targets. The prior two nights of bombing had wrought extraordinary damage, especially in the London slum area at the East End. King George the Sixth, it's a V and an I, that's a six, yeah. King George the Sixth even visited the devastated area to reassure the inhabitants that their fellow countrymen were with them in heart and mind. Each night since the seventh, sirens had sounded to announce the approach of incoming German planes 
which had begun dropping bombs indiscriminately in the London vicinity, even though the docks had been their primary target on day one of the Blitz. As British bombers set out for Germany to retaliate, they were instructed not to return home with their bombs if they failed to locate their original targets. Instead, they were to release their loads when and where they could. On the night of September 10th, the night when British home intelligence had been alerted of how panicked Londoners were becoming at the sound of those air raid sirens, Berlin was paid in kind with a cascade of British bombs, one of which even landed in the garden of Joseph Goebbels, the <laughs> party's minister of propaganda. 1977, the guillotine falls silent as a convicted murderer becomes the last person executed by guillotine. The device had debuted on April 25, 1792, when a highwayman was the first person in revolutionary France to be executed by this method. More than 10,000 people lost their heads by guillotine during the revolution, including Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, the former king and queen of France. The last execution by guillotine occurred in 1977, and France outlawed capital punishment altogether in 1981. If you ever find yourself in Sweden, look for a museum dedicated to the guillotine in Leiden, Sweden. 1977, Charlene Williams and Gerald Gallego met at a poker club in Sacramento, California, and went on to become one of the worst serial killing teams in American history. They did finally get caught and went to trial. Charlene rolled over on Gerald, testifying against him in court. Gerald was tried in both Nevada and California and received death sentences in both, for whatever that's worth, California. He died of cancer in a prison hospital in 2002, and Charlene was sentenced to 16 years and 8 months in jail. She was released in 1997 and took up a quiet life under an assumed name after her release. 1981, one of Spanish artist Pablo Picasso's most important works, the monumental anti-war mural Guernica, inspired by the destruction of the Basque town of Guernica by the <laughs> party's air force during the Spanish Civil War. In 1939, Picasso gave the painting to New York's Museum of Modern Art on an extended loan and decreed that it not be returned to Spain until democratic liberties were restored in the country. Its eventual return to Spain on this day in 1981, eight years after Picasso's death, was celebrated as a moral endorsement of Spain's young democracy. 2008, CERN, Large Hadron Collider, is powered up. On September 10, 2008, scientists successfully flipped the switch for the first time of the Large Hadron Collider, also known as LHC, at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, also known as CERN. The CERN lab in Geneva, Switzerland, kicking off what many called history's biggest science experiment. This would be different from the science experiments that happen in the back of my refrigerator that involve blue hair. <laughs> okay, okay, back to the text. All right, let's see here. The 17-mile underground ring located beneath the Swiss-French border sends particle beams at the speed of light, causing them to collide and recreate debris presumably caused by the Big Bang. At the time of its launch, some scientists and environmentalists speculated that the LHC would create a mini black hole that could end the world. These claims were refuted by CERN and physicist Stephen Hawking, who said that any many black holes would evaporate it instantly. The goal of the LHC, the largest scientific instrument on the planet, was to create and discover the Higgs boson, better known as the God particle. In 1964, Peter Higgs and Francois Englert came up with the theory that the particle associated with a mass transmitting energy field was the key to how everything in the universe acquires mass. The goal of the LHC, the largest scientific instrument on the planet, was to create and discover the Higgs boson, better known as the God particle. In 1964, Peter Higgs and Francois Englert came up with the theory that the particle associated with a mass transmitting energy field 
was the key to how everything in the universe acquires mass. In 2012, CERN announced the LHC experiments had allowed researchers to observe a particle consistent with the Higgs boson. On October 8, 2013, Higgs and Englert were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for the theoretical discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of mass of subatomic particles and which recently was confirmed through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle by the ATLAS and CMS experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. And that's all I've come up with so far for today. I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> Golly willikers, if you have anywhere near as much fun watching these as I have making them, then we're both having a pretty good time. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Please give it a like if you enjoyed this video. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. And feel free to share. Spread this baby around. <laughs> anyway, thanks again, and I'll see you next time. All righty, let's try this again. And I just realized I don't have my microphone plugged in. Let me go get that. Momentito! <laughs> oh, that's what I thought. Okay. We will start over at the top right here. Starting over. In 2012, CERN announced that the LA... LA, 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 we so I'm wondering then if they found the Higgs boson what is there to do with the Large Hadron Collider what are they going to do with it hmm. I don't know it's pretty expensive for a science experiment but that ain't none of my business okay this day in history. That is a long ass sentence. Since particle beams at the speed of light call it, calling them to coincide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I forgot the dictator was still on. Let's open it up a little wider. Open wide. <laughs> That's the whole thing right there. Holy cow. Okay. Do I really have to look that up again? Okay. That doesn't sound right either. September 10, this day in history. Okay, hold on. One of these. She's very tensely looking at it. She wants her baby. That's a good baby. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll try it again. Some people pronounce it Hadron, some Hadron. I'm going to call it Hadron. That's not quite it either. Okay. There we go. Okay. Don't make me squeak that pig again. <laughs> Maybe.